to present a really interesting book. So Rick Banks' important book is Marriage for White People. Um, addresses issues and realities that we all have intuitions about and puts together that research in popular and accessible form. And I think that's a really important contribution. Um, his methodology cites to the, to the social science research but relies more heavily on anecdote, and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but is based on his interviews, is, is largely based on his interviews with a group of interviewees which, although diverse, is, consists largely, I think, yeah, I think it's fair to say, of middle-aged, upper-middle-class, professional black women. Uh, our time, unfortunately, is limited, um, and so I'll have to oversimplify when I try to present his, uh, when I try to present his arguments. So he asks, is marriage for white people? Um, and the, su the subtitle, How the African Ameri American Marriage Decline Affects Everyone, is not the most developed part of his argument. I don't think it's primarily what the book is about. Um, as I understand it, his argument is really addressed, uh, primarily addressed, to heterosexual black women of the kind he interviewed, unmarried, highly educated professionals, mostly in their 40s and 50s, who would like to get married but haven't done so. Um, and I'm going to sort of organize my summary um, around the malady that Professor Banks perceives, the diagnosis um, that he offers, and the prescription that he recommends. So first of all, he sees a malady in black communities, which is that marriage is in trouble. Black people have, in, black Americans have lower marriage rates, higher divorce rates, and lower self-reported marital satisfaction compared to other Americans. Um, even when black people have children, we are reluctant to marry each other, it seems. Um, the, by far the majority of black children today are born uh, to unmarried parents. And I think it's fair to say that he um, understands the decline of marriage in black communities as an undesirable development. Um, he also documents a, a, a disturbing level of distrust between African American men and women. Um, as he put, as his interviewees suggest that uh, African American women believe, with good reason, that black men will have other partners even if they've promised fidelity. Um, they expect, many of his interviewees expect men to let them down. Some of them react with anger and bitterness toward black men. Others, thinking that this is all they can get, settle for non-monogamous relationships when they want exclusivity. Um, and many men that he interviewed in turn believe that black women might be harsh, angry, and suspicious, or that they're playing them for money. In this context, it's not surprising that women, and men for that matter, might not marry if that's what their relationships look like. Um, he shows that his, interviewer, that his interviewees say they want to get married, um, but he doesn't really analyze why, which is one of the questions that I have. Um, so his diagnosis um, is that, was, why are black people not getting married? Again, to oversimplify, his diagnosis is that there is a man shortage. And those of you who've read the handout will have read the chapter that sets that out. Um, that there, that um, sometimes the man shortage is focused on the black community overall, and sometimes he's talking about a shortage of available men who would be appropriate matches for upper middle class professional black women. Um, so given the large number of men who are incarcerated, unemployed, or haven't finished college, he sees there being very few, and his interviewees also see, there being very few marriageable black men um, compared to the number of upper middle class black women who are interested in, marry, in marriage. Um, that black men, as he puts it, have so many options for dating or marrying black women and other women um, that they may not want to settle for just one. Um, and so Professor Banks says that uh, of those black professional women who do marry, too many of them marry down, he says. Marrying down is marrying men who share their cultural background but do not share their education or their current class status. Um, so, and they do so out of a misguided sense, he says, of racial, of ra racial solidarity. Of racial solidarity. Um, this is a problem, he says, for a number of reasons. These marriages, he say, lack companionship because the partners are not peers. Uh, the man feels inadequate because he's unable to provide for his family. There's financial distrust and power struggles over money. Um, that the couples have absolutely different values in that the husband just doesn't value education as much as the wife does. Um, and finally, he says, um, he uses the example of a woman who was stabbed to death by her husband um, to, in, to show that these marrying down relationships pose a risk of domestic violence. Um, he also cites an empirical finding, although I wasn't able to find the citation, maybe it was there and I missed it, that marriages in which the woman earns substantially more than the man are more likely to break up 
the marriages in which the man earns substantially more than the woman. Um, and his prescription um, is out marriage, that black women who want to get married should consider marrying white men, um, who they could meet through education or work, and who will be their peers. Um, he says that white men are more interested in marrying black women than black women think they are. Um, his interviewees recall men, white men who asked them out in law school. Um, and he also points out that even though internet dating studies show that out of the less than 60% of white men who state any racial preference in internet dating, 90% exclude black women, um, which means that just over half of white men are interested, at least on the internet, are interested in dating black women. Um, moreover, if they say that they don't want black women, it might really be that they don't want overweight women um, and because black women are more likely to be overweight. Um, he says that increased outmarriage by black women, if black women were to marry non-black men more often, this would be beneficial both to the women as individuals who would find satisfying relationships um, and to um, the black community as a whole because, because reducing the imbalance between black men and black women would cause black men to improve their behavior in order to be able to get women or get, get wives. So marrying out will benefit not only black women but also the black community. So I have sort of questions, well, I have lots of questions, but I'll ask three. <laughs> um, so they're not really about the malady, sadly, many measures, the African Americans turn out worse than the American average and worse than white Americans on many measures of, of physical and social well-being. Um, although I query whether being single is necessarily a bad thing in the circumstances he describes. But my questions are more about his diagnosis of the problem and, and his re proposed remedy. Um, first of all, he's, he seems optimistic that in interracial marriages, racial or cultural differences, including the white partner's lack of understanding about racism, are superficial differences that can be overcome by love and commitment. Um, whereas interclass marriage, when black women marry down within the black community, um, that educational differences between the wife and her less educated husband are meaningful differences that are very difficult to overcome, with, that love and commitment can't necessarily overcome. And that this is really a values difference between the black woman who valued education enough to get to overcome the obstacles to get it, and the black man who didn't, uh, the black man who didn't finish college because he didn't value education as much. Um, but what I wonder, in terms of the peer relationship between a professional black woman and a professional white man, is whether having similar educational achievement reflects similar commitment to education. I mean, does it take the same amount of discipline and commitment for a white man born into a family of lawyers? Um, to go to law school as it does for a black woman who is born in a low-income segregated community who's the first person in her family to go to college. They may not, their similar educational levels may not reflect similar values. Um, in the final chapter of his book, the example he concludes with, Teresa and Charlie, a black woman and a, black ma and a white man who are happily married with a mutually respectful and loving relationship, seem to have what he would call a marrying down relationship if their finances were reversed. Um, Charlie is the one marrying down here by this description. He, um, Professor Banks describes Charlie as born and raised on the west side of Los Angeles, played basketball at UCLA before embarking on a successful business career, whereas Teresa was born in Louisiana and had two children by different fathers. He's rich, she's not. When they started dating, she lived in a townhouse in a working class minority neighborhood that he had only glimpsed from the freeway even though he'd grown up here. Um, so I'd like to see more explanation than Professor Banks offers as to why marrying down is problematic when the woman makes more money and not when the man does. And he does offer, he does offer some um, answer to this question, which is that tradition provides useful scripts and that the absence of a traditional script, um, that where the man makes more money and the woman is at home or makes less money, um, there are traditional scripts that couples can draw upon. That the absence of these scripts for the higher earning woman couple um, results in struggle, confusion, uncertainty, and resentment. But I wonder why it would be more feasible to rewrite racial scripts um, and yet insurmountably difficult to rewrite scripts about gender and class. Um, especially when the white partner doesn't understand something, racism, that's really important to the black woman. Um, and some data uh, do suggest that interracial marriages are more likely to break up. Um, so, I wonder what, so I wonder what he thinks about that. My second question um, is that he diagnoses the man shortage as a numbers problem. But I wonder whether his prescription, the strategy that, black, that professional black women should marry out, could apply broadly enough to make a dent in these numbers. 
Um, he, addresses, he addresses this prescription to what he describes as middle or upper middle class women. But his interview subjects aren't really middle class. They're described as lawyers and investment managers. If you earn between $150,000 and $200,000 a year, you're not middle class even though you might feel middle class. You're in the top 6% of income for all Americans. And for black Americans, you're going to be even in, an, in an even more rarefied percentile. Um, so even if many of these women were to marry out, I'm not sure what it would do about the man uh, how much it would affect the man shortage overall. Um, also, um, the percentage of that black marriages, he says, are less happy overall by the self-described happiness of the, of the partners. There's probably, but I, I suspect there's probably a larger number of happy black marriages than of interracial marriages that involve a black woman. So again, that would make me wonder how, how much of a difference interracial marriage is going to make um, to the man shortage. Um, I also wonder how broadly his analysis applies, um, whether it applies to younger, younger black women, poorer black people, or African or West Indian immigrants who might not have the same levels of, um, of bitterness over oppression, direct oppression by whites of their parents and grandparents and of themselves when they were young. And my final question is close to my heart, um, which is, what about the children? <laughs> um, and mixed children, they, they, he, says, he says that many of these women, especially light-skinned women, are worried that their children may not look visibly African. I'm married to a white man, I'm light-skinned. I gotta say, my son has red hair and blue eyes and so far does not look visibly African. Um, so I know that, it, this is a, that this is a reality, that they may not look black. Um, Professor Banks optimistically predicts that, children, that, racial, that racial identities are changing and that children with one black and one white parent will get to define their own identities. Um, I think that's a little optimistic. It seems to me that racial, that no matter how you define yourself, your own identity, it's applied to you by others. So that if I think that I'm white and I'm 50% white, um, that doesn't make any difference in a culture where I am clearly black. Um, and I wonder whether for my son, and particularly, particularly since I think that the one, one drop rule is in decline, it seems to me, um, based on my observations, that most people think that if you, nowadays it doesn't matter about your ancestry. If you look white, you are white. Um, so that even if children like my son, who look European, um, may feel African, I wonder whether that's really going to make much of a difference to how others see and treat them. So um, those, are, those are my questions. Wow.